So, hello everyone, my name is Juan, uh, and I'm going to present my project called uh, Big Claims, which, which stands for Distributed and Verifiable Claims. So, so, a little bit about myself first. Uh, I am a student at Institute of Pyrotechnic, I am now pursuing my master's, uh, and Big Claims is my thesis project. Uh, so, first, let's um, understand what verifiable claims Has anyone here already heard of the term verifiable claims? Yeah. <laughs> Great, so what have you heard? Like yesterday. Oh, when <laughs> <laughs> you saw me working on my presentation, yeah, yeah. It's fine, okay. Yeah. So, the verifiable claims um, are a specification that is being worked on by a W3C working group. Uh, and the goal is to um, define a way to uh, make statements about some entity. Uh, and those statements are verifiable, uh, and portable, and revocable. So, a statement can be a qualification and achievement, for instance, a university that gives a degree and signs that diploma with its private key. Uh, or it can be like the government issuing, issuing a statement that says that you are over 18. So, when you're going to some place that needs to check your, for your age, you only need to show that you are over 18. They don't need to know your age exactly. You just need to know that check, it's true or false. Um, so that's the motivation behind the um, verifying the plans. As uh, technology moves forward, the more, business, more businesses turn to the internet, it becomes more and more necessary to make claims that can be verified instantaneously by any other party. What? So, as I said before, the properties of verifiable claims is, okay, there you go, so they're verifiable, mm -hmm. meaning that anyone can take a claim and audit their veracity, authenticity, integrity, etc., all that stuff. Uh, they're revocable, meaning that the entity that issued them can revoke them later. So, for instance, uh, technically, <laughs> give me my diploma, but 10 years later, somehow they find out that I cheated on all my exams. Uh, hopefully, they won't find out. <laughs> but if they do, they should be able to revoke my certificates. Makes, just makes little sense. And should be portable as well. So if Technic ceases to exist tomorrow, I should be able to take control of that claim and take it uh, to any employer to, to show it. <coughs> so the claims is uh, a project or a system that takes verifiable claims, the schema that the would receive the claims, uh, and implements it in a completely distributed and trustless manner. So essentially what the claims allows you to do is to make a claim right now. So you can make a claim, you can send the identifier of that claim to anyone else, and that person can verify that claim. Uh, and why is this uh, decentralized? How do we achieve this? So claims are stored on IPFS, you might have heard about it, um, which is great because it's a distributed file system and it gives us permanent links. So uh, the link of the claim will never be broken and it's always the same. And if the claim changes, the link changes as well. So it automatically gives you a verification of, uh, of integrity. Uh, also, we are using Ethereum which for those of you who don't know, it's like a world computer that runs on the blockchain um, and provides a useful timestamping service, a global timestamping service, that's what I mean. So uh, pretty much anyone can agree on the order of events uh, at which the claims were published. And on top of the claims, you can pretty much build any, any application you want that needs to store verifiable claims. Uh, now, motivated by recent events, we decided to use the claims to create a system to mitigate fake news. Um, yeah, well, well, okay. Uh, so, uh, what we do is we provide a way for to provide a way for humans to make claims about news articles, and then other people can see the claims that uh, those are, that those people made. Uh, but the claims need not to be uh, limited to people making claims. It can be. Um, like I said in the previous slide, you can pretty much be heard on top of um, an AI system that detects fake news and issues claims about it, and it can use deep claims as well. So, um, okay, so exactly, so the application, that's where the claim sits, right there on top. Uh, it's a browser extension that you can install on Chrome or Firefox, and that allows you to interact with pretty much any used website to make and retrieve claims. So the way this would work in a like, super high level, uh, let's say that subject A, let's call it Alice, for obvious reasons, uh, issues a claim which has an ID uh, which is one to three and the content is just hello world. Now, that claim would then be stored on IPFS, so IPFS would then um, return the multi-hash, which is the identifier of an object stored on IPFS, and then the claim takes that identifier 
and stores it on an Ethereum smart contract, which is like a program that runs on Ethereum. Uh, it's pretty much like a server, only it's super decentralized. Uh, then Ethereum returns the transaction confirmation, um, which allows you to confirm that that block is actually that transaction has actually been confirmed, so that your claim now lives on the on the network. Now I have a demo, uh, so I'm going to go there and show sort of how this works. Just a second. Okay. So if we open the Sky News website, for instance, you just reload. Uh, what the system does first, I mean, the browser extension HyperCert is it generates all the required elements to interact with the with the declaimed platform. So in this case, it generates a button where you can view the claims made about that news article, and it generates that for every <coughs> news article out there. <coughs> Uh, now, as you can see, for instance, in this news article here, I already went ahead and made a claim. Uh, and right now, the information that shows is super ugly. Essentially, it shows the news title, uh, the user that made the claim, which is my Ethereum wallet ID, uh, and the category. Like I said, that, that, new, that was fake news for some reason. Um, now, the way that the browser extension uh, interacts with um, Ethereum is it uses MetaMask, which is a browser <coughs> extension that provides a gateway for the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and with MetaMask, you can connect to your own nodes or you can connect to one of their nodes. It's pretty much up to you. Uh, and also allows to sign the messages. So let's say we want to issue a claim about, oh, well, let's take a test, see if we have the flu. OK. So uh, once this page is loaded, HyperCerts inserts this button here, which has the wrong title right now. Not HyperCerts, Declaim, sorry. HyperCerts was like the name we had the week before, so I'm still getting used to it. Uh, so if I ever say it again, you already know the problem. Um, so you can come here and contest this news article. Now this already, as you can see, the UI is terrible. Just give me a break, that's. Uh, so uh, it already shows the, um, the wallet address that you selected, your Ethereum account, that you, sorry, that you can select uh, on MetaMask. Then you can type some stuff here, whatever you want. Uh, and you can categorize that news article, like okay, extreme bias, for instance. The next step is MetaMask asks you to sign this transaction, and we're using a new type of signature that MetaMask supports called typed signature, which actually shows uh, every individual item that you are signing. So you are signing with this uh, Ethereum wallet, you are classifying it as extreme bias, and the text that you inserted is this one here. So then it signs the message, and then it asks you for a confirmation of the transaction. Uh, now, as you can see here, the price is super high, but we'll get to that later. Uh, that's also happened with all the cats running on an Ethereum right now, <laughs> which pretty much just shut off the price. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So once you submit it, uh, it gives you the transaction ID, uh, which you can, which I can then use for whatever I want. And if we go back to the other page, in about like a minute or so, the review should appear here. The network is pretty slow right now, and we can keep on checking the status here. Uh, but so we don't, so we're not in your wasting time, just trust me, it will appear here. We can come back to that later. Um, it's not there yet, is it? No, it's super slow today. Oh, uh, and this also works on another news website. So for instance, if I open the um, news website of Technic, which is pure Technic, it pretty much does the same. All you need to do is configure a small script that says in which element is the news title, what is the HTML element of the news article, and the extension just grasps onto that website. But it works in any news website? Well, it works in any news website if you give it information to work with that website. So in this case, I had to create an object that is the Technic object that tells us, so this is the domain for Technic. So when you see this domain, you load these elements. And news titles are this HTML element. And news articles, like the HTML are, um, element in which elements, uh, on which news articles are nested in, uh, is this one. So you gotta, you got to tell them that stuff. I mean, there are some open source solutions for um, news, news websites parsers, but I didn't get around to uh, just adapt one to the other one. So right now, yeah, you got to put in every website you want. Yeah, but you could like crowdsource that, so eventually you'd get pretty much any news website there working. Okay, so let me see if in the meantime... So if you wanted, we could do it like in CNN? Oh yeah, totally, you could. Uh, actually, yeah, so it's here, by the way. Uh, I went, I was trying to, so last night this only worked for technical websites. 
and from between like last night and tonight I was trying to put it on the CNN website but that website is terrible. If you open the console, it's just errors everywhere, like without doing anything. <laughs> it's just, I was like, I'm, yeah. So it was taking like 15 seconds to load my, my extension, and I was like, no way. So I just went to Sky News, because no one cares about that one. Uh, so that's the reason why. Now, going back to the slides, which are here. Cool. Uh, so, a little overview of what I just saw. So, what works today with uh, deep claims is you can simply integrate it into any news websites. You can create claims about any news article you see fit, and then you can view the claims that other people have made about that article. And all of this works on IPFS and um, Ubuntu. So the features. The most important one is that it's censorship resistant. Uh, I mean, essentially, what I've built there is a place where you can put comments, just like on Facebook. You can put Facebook and put comments in there. But Facebook is a centralized platform, it has a ton of issues, as uh, we all know. So at any point in time, they can just censor your comments, uh, and no one else will, will ever see it again. So this is not possible uh, with the claims. Furthermore, news websites have absolutely no control over this being run on their websites, because it's, it's running locally. Uh, I mean, at most, they could change the names of the elements, but it will take us like two days to just get the system up to it, so whatever. Um, also, it's secure, so Ethereum and IPFS assure the integrity and authenticity of all of, all of, all of the claims. Um, Ethereum, most, more precisely, Ethereum assures the uh, authenticity and IPFS gives the integrity because if the, hash, if the file changes, the, hash, the, the link changes as well. Uh, and there's a single point of failure, it's, uh, that's the default on the super distributed system such as this one. Uh, you would have to pretty much destroy all the IPFS nodes out there and your own uh, and all the Ethereum nodes out there as well and pretty much you wouldn't have a world at that point so <laughs> um, So what will work in the next three months which is my deadline to deliver my thesis um, <laughs> work. Uh, So first of all we're going to introduce what we call publishers uh, I don't know if you checked the price when I made that claim, but it was about $4. Yeah. And even if the Ethereum price was lower, like at $250, which is way lower than it is today, it would be still like a dollar. And none of us would pay a dollar to comment something on Facebook. I think it's way too much. Like, uh, so what publishers do is allows for claims to be issued as a batch. Uh, so a publisher is like a sidechain uh, proxy, something that stands between your uh, computer and the Ethereum network. Uh, which listens for claims about a given article. <coughs> and when a certain article achieves a threshold, let's say I'm going to wait for 100 claims for this article, then you can batch all those claims into one IPFS object and issue them on Ethereum with only one transaction. Okay. So you are splitting those $4 by 100, uh, or by the threshold that you set. Okay. You can uh, also monetize uh, all the, the, the votes from all the articles. You don't have to wait for a specific amount in one article. You could just take all the comments of everybody oh, yeah, and wrap a tree out of it. That's true. The reason why uh, we're not doing that at least yet is because the uh, on the smart contract claims are indexed by the news article. So what you do essentially is you generate a, an ID for each article, which is <coughs> based on the URL, which is not very resilient, can definitely be improved. Uh, but you get that ID and then you fetch the, the smart contract for, okay, give me all the IPFS links for claims uh, for this ID, this news article, and so it returns a list uh, with all the claims. But what you say can be that as well, for sure. It's really, it's really like a database problem. Uh, essentially, what variable are going to be indexing data by? And right now, just for um, demonst demonstration purposes, I chose to index of the news article. But yeah, you can make like a repository for all the claims and use a much better way of storing the, the claims for sure. Absolutely. Uh, so publishers will allow to reduce the cost of issuing. Uh, you can even have like a publisher system running distributedly, in a, yeah, in the distributed form where nodes agree upon themselves to issue claims for a given article. So we don't really need a centralized uh, uh, um, authority there. You can just have like uh, some program that runs on a, a, a distributed network uh, and then issues the claims that way. Uh, oh yeah, so just one thing, and that would put hyper, uh, like D claims as a Facebook like button. You could pretty much make as many as you want. Uh, there would be no limits. You would not be congesting the Ethereum network like cats do. Uh, so it would be really cool. Uh, and we also think about introducing curators, which are entities that take claims that already exist and generate new claims. 
So uh, an example of a curator would be, I would take all the claims that I can find <coughs> about that article that you just saw about the flu, and then I make a new claim that says 70% uh, of the claims classify this as fake news, then there are 20% that say that this is a good article, and then there are 10% that say whatever. Uh, and that would be a new claim. So you could essentially subscribe to claims made by curators because you would have more information than single claims. Okay. Oh, and you can also build like a reputation system on top of curators, like with tokens or something. So uh, curators with more reputation, their claims would have would be weighed higher uh, in any algorithm you could then run to analyze claims and display information. So yeah, that's that's for today. Thank you. Ask, is it, um, obviously, it's like this information wars that are going on these days, which is why this kind of work is important. But is it possible to, or have you thought about how like bots and bot armies can falsify the false news by yeah. saying things legitimate? I know the whole curation thing that we're talking about, and there's all these subset levels. And like, yeah. I know, like, for just the like, dark web websites, mm -hmm. their review systems actually work, I think, quite well. Buys and legitimate purchases for things and stuff. So I was just wondering, you know, can that cause trouble, or have you considered that? Well, a smart um, contract is essentially like it's a server with an API that anyone can use as long as they pay for it. Uh, so in this case, it's true that anyone can write claims into the Ethereum contract, but on the user side, there is a, you have to create a whitelist uh, saying the issuers that you trust. So you say, I want to trust A, B, and C, and if there's a claim from D, I'll never see that claim. Um, I mean, you can actually implement a reputation on top of that, obviously, which is a whole other world. Uh, or you can just trust the people that your friends trust. And if one of the people on, in your right list ever screws up, you can just remove it from the list. And that's case closed. Um, and I mean, yeah, and al also there is the obvious uh, barrier of the costs. Uh, but with publishers, it essentially becomes free to create claims, so that would be a problem. But there's a whitelist thing there. And furthermore, publishers have an interest on not publishing like bullshit claims. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to somehow have a strong confirmation of the person's identity. So, on the side of publishers, you could implement something along the lines of decentralized identifiers, the IDs, uh, which is something that you guys can, can look for after, uh, which is essentially a way of identifying people using blockchains as well. So even the identification system is completely decentralized. There are some based on um, Ethereum, like what's the name? Uport. Oh, yeah, Uport, exactly. You also have BTCR, which is built on top of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have all of these tools that you can use to mitigate that problem, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's an open list, true, but you can choose what you want to see. I don't really get why you are using uh, Ethereum because it's more for a kind of dynamic thing, a smart contract that is that has a state and runs over time. And here it's more like a static thing with the indexing. Don't, isn't there any way to do it in a more efficient? So or kind of indexing mechanism on the top of IPFS. I don't know. There are I think there are some databases like BitChain or. That provides some kind of indexing mechanism. HNDB. Mm -hmm. HNDB. That, that essentially is a centralized point of failure there. Um, because even though it's, it's the HNDB runs on EPFS, you still have to talk to their servers. That's how HNDB works. But uh, furthermore, like what you want to do in the future is put everything in Ethereum. I mean, you, you wouldn't, it's true. Ideally, you, would want, you, you wouldn't want to do any competition yourself. If things go forward as they should go, it will become much cheaper and much more common commonplace to do computation on Ethereum, so you can do it there. Uh, also, Ethereum is really the only way I can think to make it completely distributed and trustless. Because if I was going to introduce a server somewhere, I could just use Facebook. It gives me the same guarantees. Mary, uh, uh, so that question is related with mutability question. You can totally have a thing like IPNS point to the latest state of the registry of all the claims that exist. Mm -hmm. And then you can use CRDTs to then make sure that that index coalesces, converges very quickly. Um, but you still rely of some infrastructure to be present at all times that be, can be consulted at all times. And if you need something to be present at all times, then you have the world computer that's running and like being verified and being checked. Right, so like you use Ethereum to make sure that the index, the registry is always there, and that you always have this point of contact. 
So because like if I did that through IPNS or CRTs, I would still I would still to rely on <coughs> X amount of nodes of my PFS to fetch the data. And if you want to be absolutely like almost meteor proof, you want to have something that never stops running. Mm. Make sense? Connect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, set number questions? No? Cool. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, how do you feel about, so, like, I get that uh, the pub using publishers is a uh, like, solution to having people not have to pay the transaction fees for um, making claims, but, uh, like, what do you feel about, uh, uh, like, confirmation bias from people say like trusting a certain publisher and trusting their friends and I mean that like seems like basically the problem of fake yeah. news. That's, right? that's yeah. like a great question. It's one that's like went around my mind for months. <laughs> which is um, like that will always exist. Uh, so right now I can give you like the best proof of something like a super scientific proof of something and if you didn't believe it before, most likely you won't believe it now. So this is about allowing that to people who actually want to know the truth, they have a good way of knowing it. Uh, that people are actually interested in learning and not uh, like going over their biases. Mm -hmm. This is not about show like this isn't about uh, convincing people that global warming is reality. It's this, that's not the target audience at all because those people will just say yeah whatever uh, you're lying or like flat Earth. That's probably the best example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually crazy. I mean, those guys, they shouldn't be able to use this. <laughs> Get out. Um, so the goal here is, if you actually want to know, you want to learn and educate yourself, we're trying to lower the difficulty while we're doing it. Uh, that's, the, that's the goal here, like for everyone here. I think there was also another question, right? Because like, there was the trust in the publisher. Oh, okay, trust in the publisher, okay. Okay, yeah. that's, a, that's also a great question. So essentially, when you issue a claim to the publisher, um, the publisher gives you receipts like something that he just signed, like timestamp, I received this claim, this is the hash of received, signed, boom, you got it. Uh, you can also say something like, this should be issued within the next hour. Uh, you, you can like, have some metrics to know how long it will take. Uh, and then, like two hours go by, you want Ethereum, you query that, um, that, that transaction, I mean, that block, that, that claim that you made. If you don't get it back, you can yourself make a claim saying this issuer promised me to issue to this publisher promised me to issue this claim, but it didn't. So then you would have a list of misbehaved publishers, and you would stop trusting those publishers. Yeah, which is an option that you don't have with Facebook, for instance. Or you got to trust them all. Yeah. That's the goal there. Yeah. To be annoying with you, if you thought about the receipt, which is a good way to do it, then you don't need the blockchain because you don't need the timestamping server as long as you have the receipt from the server. So you could have a central single point of failure if you want. It could be it could be distributed or like replicated, uh, <coughs> even if centrally controlled. Because as long as like as soon as you push your uh, reputation vote mm -hmm. and say this is a good article, they have to send you a receipt, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't send you a receipt, you use another publisher to spot them. But if they give you a receipt and then they don't count your vote, you have ways to verify that. In well, the way they give the result, they could give the result as as I was saying before, like a merger tree or any any kind of tree, like hash mm -hmm. hash tree, um, and you can verify that your claim is really in there. And if it's not, then you have your receipt, so you can prove that the publisher is in bad behavior mode. So you don't need your timestamping server, which is the blockchain, which is really like this is a good use case of blockchain, the timestamping server. But you don't really need it because you have a receipt. Well, so what you have in the case of curators, you'd like to have the blockchain uh, for when they are issuing claims that are dependent on other claims, and using. The metrics that you're suggesting removing the blockchain uh, essentially would be dependent on publishers always. There wouldn't be a way to circumvent this. In this case, publishers are an option. If your organization is big, big enough, you can pay for your own claims. You don't really need a publisher for anything. Uh, this is really about Facebook comments, making sure that you can scale to that dimension. Uh, and again, like I said, ideally, you want to override publishers. You don't want to be you want to make it uh, economical. You want to make, you want to create an economic incentive to make good claims and somehow be rewarded for that, and that way you will somehow be able to pay for your claims all the time, and you wouldn't need the publisher at all. Publishers, publishers is like an optimization right now for scalability um, that you need today to make it, to make everyone use it, but in the future I don't think you'll need a publisher. Maybe, maybe you will. I don't know. <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you, want, you have a way to show that the publisher misbehave. Sorry? You have a way to show that the publisher misbehave. Um, and why don't you just penalize the publisher which misbehave by asking them some kind of security deposit and burning part of it if they misbehave? Oh, like creating a proof of stake. Essentially, it's. Uh, so, I'm a publisher, I, I put a deposit, and if I give a receipt to someone and I don't include it, this someone can make a transaction to show that I give him a receipt. Oh, okay. So yeah. You could create so a smart contract. My deposit. Yeah, you could create a smart contract for that, sure. That's uh, that's something we could do, absolutely. Yeah. And that's also a solution for your scalability problem. Because in that case, you use the blockchain as a punishment mechanism. Not as a timestamp. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So it's the opposite. You just force the publisher to put money on the blockchain. That's not. And then you can use it as a central point because if it doesn't give you uh, uh, like a count of the votes, that includes one of the votes you have a receipt for. You can publish that to the blockchain that will take the deposit. Okay. Is that like something to stick with? What do you think about that? He's my co advisor in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, Jen is his fault. So Jen is working on this type of uh, punishment mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. This is our game theory expert. We hope your prof won't find this footage. Although <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Big good question for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. 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 Rolling yeah. Rolling so we have an answer for that. Do you have an answer for that? No, I don't know what's wrong. It's I mean, I still like the idea of I'll be having it built on Ethereum so you can build more stuff later. Uh, I don't know if it's super basic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Or do we have to think about it to see if it's feature proof or anything? You might want to do the, <coughs> the thing for the feedback. It's, uh, I'm a Bitcoin like maximalist. Sorry, I'm biased. <laughs> 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 I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it makes sense because you can also have uh, smart contracts and DAO. As claimer that you would not really have if you would not link to Ethereum. Also, so in like oh, using, using a smart contract, contract as to as yeah, a client generator, as you made, you have one person who made a claim, but it could be a smart contract, uh, which would be a smart of regulation making a claim, mm -hmm. or some kind of oracle or something like that. We can talk about it later if you're interested. And also, there's the way of, there's the thing of um, authenticating the issuer. Like, because right now Ethereum gives you that for free. Like, you can just use the message sender to make sure that someone is who they say they are. Um, and if it publishes, you probably <coughs> you would have to. PGP does the same. Yeah, that's the whole thing. PGP, even though decentralized, I mean, the uh, public infrastructure, uh, there's no other movement called rebooting level of trust, mm -hmm. which is essentially trying to make PGP 2.0 fully distributed. Uh, on top of Bitcoin, so yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you you will also be needing that. But yeah, we, we should talk about that. Yeah. The common thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so is that a fish? Well, just like, uh, how long until you think people might start actually using these types of services or the, the, this type of service? Well, this one you could use it right now if you uh, withstand the terrible user interface. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also it's only deployed on the test net, it's not deployed on the main. You mean like that other users to be contributing to legitimize the Absolutely. So, uh, and you need uh, IPFS nodes running. That's another thing. You should have like servers that are pinning the claims. Because the thing here is, I make a claim. I close my laptop. No one else has the claim. No one else can retrieve the claim. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a way to signal that claim to some other server. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So mass adoption is required for this to work flawlessly. I'm sure. Like, I know there's a lot of things going on in blockchain that are waiting for mass adoption. Uh, it's just, that's, that's kind of always just an interesting question because all these things are they're hypothetical, mm -hmm. but they're awesome things that could really change the world. But I just wonder how long it might take, you know, for them to become mainstream. Three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be working great. In three <laughs> 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 So, all good? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah.